It's time now then to recall Mr. Borden Kircher. Uh, Mr. Borden Kircher, could you please come on up to the stand? And just for the record, you've already been sworn. You're still sworn in. Yes, Your Honor. Ms. Ho, do you have any preliminary? I do not. He is free to be called and asked for additional questions. Okay. Uh, when we left off, Mr. Woodward, it, it was in the middle of your cross-examination, and I appreciate um, the courtesy that you've extended to allow the other witnesses to appear so that they could get on the stand today. Please continue. If the green light is on, it should be. It might have been um, adjusted a little bit when Mr. Sabo was up here. Sometimes they do that in the, the control room, so in a minute they'll turn it up for you as soon as they realize that they can't hear you very well. So just. So keep talking. Hey, there we go. There you go. Um, Mr. Bordenkircher, uh, there were a number of questions yesterday that. You didn't have answers to, and I'm just wondering if you found any answers uh, overnight to those questions. In your honor, uh, just wanted to note for the record again, we did object to having to do any additional data requests or discovery um, now that Mr. Borenkircher has already taken the stand. Thank you for, re for restating that. You state, APS stated that yesterday, and I stated yesterday that I wouldn't be requiring any more data re requests responses. I thought maybe something here. might have come to him in a dream or, you know, something like that. You can always ask. That's right. Um, so we left off with the uh, electric power requirement uh, for the transmitter and uh, it's actually DC is the answer to, the, to that question. Um, so uh, since APS uh, does not deliver DC power uh, do you know where the DC power comes from that powers the transmitter and the smart meter? I do not, Mr. Woodward. I would assume uh, that there is some component of the meter that changes AC power to DC power in order to have it powered if in case in the event that that is indeed what powers a transmitter, but I'm not familiar with the inner workings of a meter. Yeah, you're, you're correct. It's, uh, it's called a switching mode power supply. Are you familiar with with that, it's also abbreviated as SMPS. I have heard the term, but not familiar with the component. Okay, so you wouldn't know how uh, the switching mode power supply changes AC to DC? I do not, sir. Uh, does a switching mode power supply generate any kind of electromagnetic interference or dirty electricity? I'm not aware of the answer to that question, sir. And so you wouldn't know what frequencies the SMPS puts out? I do not. Do you know if the FCC tests for or has electromagnetic capability regulations for any kilohertz frequencies generated by a switching mode power supply? Uh, I do not. I'm only familiar with the FCC's requirements for transmitting equipment as a whole. Do you know of any scientific literature linking switching mode power supply frequencies to animal or human morbidity and mortality? Uh, I have seen references to such in testimony you have filed, but I am not familiar with uh, the content of those documents. Do you know why the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is a division of the World Health Organization, considers microwaves a class 2B carcinogen? I do not. At uh, page 6, lines uh, 20 to 23 of uh, APS 10, you stated that, quote, the ACC requested that the Arizona Department of Health Services, ADHS, conduct a study on the safety of AMI meters. The resulting report published in November 2014 confirmed that the meters tested were operating within Federal Communications Commission FCC standards. What standards are those, Mr. Bordenkircher? I'm aware that the FCC regulates uh, again, transmitting equipment in terms of the um, safe um, 
level of RF and that our meters fall within those standards and in fact well within those standards. Uh, at page 6, lines 24 and 25 of APS 10, you stated that, quote, RF transmissions of the type utilized by AMI are regulated by the FCC and APS's AMI meters fully comply with all FCC regulations. Does that compliance mean the RF transmissions are safe? Uh, I believe the FCC holds the jurisdiction to regulate safety, and if they are therefore under those regulations, I believe the answer to that question is yes. At page 6, lines 24 and 25 of APS 10, you stated that, quote, RF transmissions of the type utilized by AMI are regulated by the FCC, and APS's uh, AMI meters fully comply with all FCC regulations. Do you know that frequencies up to 100 kilohertz are not regulated by the FCC if they are conducted emissions, like those in APS smart meters uh, emit? Uh, again, I am aware that the FCC regulates the safety of transmitting devices and our meters comply with those regulations. But you don't know about if they regulate uh, frequencies up to 100 kilohertz or not? I, I am not familiar with the specifics. I only know that they regulate the safety of our meters and our meters comply with those regulations. Do you know what conducted emissions are? I do not. At page 6, lines uh, 21, uh, like, excuse me, lines 20 and 21 of APS 10, you stated that, quote, uh, the ACC requested the Arizona Department of Health Services to conduct a study on the safety of AMI meters. Uh, and you included that study uh, as an attachment SBB-1SR of your pre-filed uh, testimony, which was uh, APS 10. Um, as part of the study, were smart meters tested for frequencies in the 2 to 100 kilohertz range? No, I do not recall, Mr. Woodward. Okay, for this next question, I have a couple items I'd like to introduce. takers okay one of those was Woodward uh, 2.2 uh, mr. Borden Kircher do you stand by your supplemental response uh, to that data request, Woodward 2.2, in which you state that uh, APS's Elster node smart meters transmit for an average duration of 17 seconds per day? Uh, I do. Okay. Uh, then how do you explain that at the March 23rd, 2012 ACC smart meter workshop meeting, at 5.08 on the meeting's video archives posted at the ACC website, uh, APS's uh, Michael Gogan declared unequivocally that, quote, what the vendor actually states is that on average they communicate 15 minutes a day, end quote. So I was not present at this meeting where Michael Gogan stated what he stated, one, two, I haven't even read this document, so I don't know specifically what he said in a broader context or what the broader context of that meeting was. Um, I can only stand by my supplemental response, which specifically states uh, the meter manufacturers report that. In other words, this is coming directly from the manufacturer, and they quote a 17-second-per-day 
um, for Elster and 83 seconds per day for LNG. Okay, if you want to take a moment and, and read that whole transcript of uh, Michael Gogan, that's, that's, that, was, that is the context, and I highlighted the, the relevant portions, but that's the entire context of, of, his, uh, of his statement. I'm not you know, taking something out of context or performing any tricks here. Your Honor, I don't mean to interrupt. Could I get a quick clarification from Mr. Woodward on um, this exhibit? It says transcript of Michael um, Gogan. And I was just wondering, I know this is a, a from the ACC video archives. I was wondering uh, who conducted the transcript, because I don't believe there is a actual official transcript from uh, ACC Commission workshops. Okay. First, I want to um, make sure that we know what exhibits we're talking about. Mr. Woodward, you've handed the witness and provided to the parties something that's marked as Woodward Exhibit 3-4, correct? That's correct. And we, we need to identify that for the record. Yeah, that's uh, Woodward 2.2 uh, uh, data request. And APS's response there too, correct? Right. Now, um, you have also handed out a one-page document that is marked Woodward 3-5. Right. And it has a title at the top that says Transcript of Michael Gogan before the ACC, comma, March 23rd, 2012 ACC, quote, smart, unquote, meter workshop meeting from 5.08 at the ACC video archives. That's correct. Can you explain the provenance of this document? Yeah, I uh, I loaded the uh, the video minutes, and uh, I wrote down what I heard there, and I and I you know you can listen to about four to six words, and you write them down, and then you then you you know resume the recording, and you write down again what you've heard, and anybody can go to the website and and see that what I wrote down is the truth, and I believe that um, you said we could you know, do some excerpts from the video, um, from Mr. the video. Mr. Gayer minutes. asked if he could cite to the video instead of to the official transcript. I don't remember speaking about the videos in, in any other context in this proceeding. Is yeah, that what, what you're referring to? Yes, yes. Okay. I just, we just need to identify this document and where it came from. And it sounds like that's what we're, we, you've done. You went on the the Commission's video uh, archive website, and you transcribed this yourself. I did. Did you have this attached to any of your pre-filed testimony? Just I think I did, but there's... Um, I Actually, I think that that was... Uh, you know, I had so many motions to compel, and I think that was maybe in one of the motions to compel. I, I don't... I mean, I could find out for you, but off the top of my head right now, I don't think it was in uh, any of the pre-file testimony. I think it was maybe in one of the, the motions where we were having a lot of back and forth uh, over trying to get a a APS to, to uh, answer my questions. Okay. I, that satisfies me as to an identification of the document. So please proceed. So, Mr. Bordenkircher, have you had time to read that? I have had time to read it. And so how do you explain that um, 
Mr. Gogan said that they transmit 15, uh, average duration of 15 minutes a day according to the vendor, and you're saying 17 seconds. It's kind of a big difference there. So my my issue with answering your question, Mr. Woodward, respectfully, is that there's a lot of times mentioned in uh, Mr. Gogan's statements, I guess is the right word, um, that I can interpret as him simply meaning that there is a 15-minute period or an equivalent of 15 minute where in very small millisecond transmissions occur because there's a comment earlier up that says the pulses are very short. Um, there's also statements in here made about the fact that um, some of this testing it appears, and again I'm reading this for the first time, was done um, assuming that the transmitter or other components of the meter were broken and so it was in effect stuck on, my, my words. Um, so, so I'm not sure, again, exactly what was the intent of this statement by Mr. Gogan. I was not there. I can't ask him what his intent was, so I, I just can't answer your question. I have no, no basis on which to make those comparisons. I do know when we specifically asked our meter vendors in order to construct our supplemental response to your data request that these are the answers, these being in Woodward Exhibit 3-4, uh, that we were given. At page 8, lines 4 and 5 of APS 10, you stated that, quote, analog meters can no longer be purchased from APS's meter vendors because they are no longer being manufactured. <clears throat> can you explain why, I've, why I have heard that from APS since 2011, yet APS keeps coming up with analog meters when requested? Uh, so I stand by the statement that APS's current meter vendors do not produce analog meters. Uh, we do have some original analog meters that we uh, purchased long ago that we continue to refurbish in order to handle those situations uh, wherein customers, at least at the moment, um, in the intermediate stages of not having the opt-out request fully, fully commission approved in order to service those customers as well as potentially some customers that, again, couldn't have uh, AMI at the time for whatever technical reasons. Uh, so, again, we're... I stand by my statement, our manufacturers, our vendors do not manufacture those meters. We have not purchased any meters from them uh, because we can't. And that's, that's how we still have a, a stock of some that are refurbished. Are you aware that SRP supplies analog meters to its customers who refuse smart meters? I cannot comment on the practices of SRP in this area. At page 8, lines 5 to 7 of APS 10, you stated that, quote, Used analog meters can still be found on the secondary market, but these are typically refurbished and may not meet APS's quality controls for reliability and customer safety. Aren't uh, refurbished analog meters available for sale calibrated and guaranteed? Uh, I do not know, but even if they were, again, we have contracts or have had contracts throughout our history for utility-grade equipment in order to ensure that it meets our quality standards and in order to ensure the safety of um, our folks and obviously our customers and the public. Um, we do that through contracting with specific firms that we have vetted. And so, again, regardless of what claims may be made on the secondary market, uh, we would not simply just trust those claims and or purchase those products and put them on uh, people's houses. So um, at page 7, line 9 of APS 10, uh, you stated that, quote, APS also tests a random sample of all meters it receives. Um, also, doesn't APS have a meter testing program that all customers pay for that includes a yearly report to the ACC? Um, I do not remember if we do or don't, sir. So one of the policies uh, being proposed in the uh, settlement agreement is um, immediately removing all analog meters and replacing with uh, digital um, I took APS service at a Sedona house last September, uh, and after an incredible amount of hassle with APS customer service, uh, I got what appears to be uh, a brand new analog meter on the house. 
What sense does it make for that perfectly good analog meter that will probably last 30 years or more to be replaced uh, with a meter that won't? Uh, so I don't necessarily agree that that meter will last 30 years, nor do I agree that a replacement meter might not last 30 years. What I will say is that by consolidating down to a subset of meters, that reduces costs for APS and its customers. Regarding smart meter service life at page 8, line 10 of APS 10, you stated that, quote, APS had proposed a 20-year service life in its depreciation rate study. Upon what is that proposed 20-year service life based? So the um, Arizona Corporation Commission sets the depreciation schedules and has in the past for APS as it relates to this type of equipment. Um, APS believed and proposed that that uh, useful life or depreciation schedule should be lower than what it has been in the past, and this was a term that was negotiated during the settlement agreement um, and was agreed to by the settling parties and now will be up to the Arizona Cor Corporation Commission to rule on. Are you aware that the Navapache Electric Cooperative is currently replacing all its smart meters because the smart meters did not last longer than six years? I am not aware of that, no. Regarding measurements uh, taken uh, by my witness, forensic electrical engineer Eric Anderson, at page 8, lines 20 to, 20 to 22 of your uh, APS 10, you stated that, quote, although Mr. Anderson focuses on a particular meter, the manufacturer that builds that meter has confirmed that they also have not seen any impact to power quality due to the meters. Uh, Mr. Bordenkircher, are you aware that smart meter manufacturers have to send in compliance reports to the FCC to vouch that the conducted emissions of their meters comply with FCC electromagnetic compatibility rega regulations and that those reports always show an impact on power quality? Uh, so I'm not acquainted with the exact process or what reporting structure companies have. Uh, again, I am familiar with the fact that at some point the FCC decides that those uh, transmitting devices are compliant with its regulations, and that's what I am aware of, and that's what we know to be true. Regarding measurements taken by my witness, uh, Eric Anderson, at page 8, lines 25 and 26 of APS 10, you stated that, uh, quote, we are not, however, suggesting that Mr. Anderson's opinion does not reflect actual events. That statement confuses me, and I seek clarification. Are you referring to the measurements Mr. Anderson took as his opinion or as something that actually happened? I apologize for the confusion of that sentence, Mr. Woodward. The intent was simply to say that when our engineers conducted similar tests, we could not uh, see the same results that Mr. Anderson did, but did not want to imply that Mr. Anderson was uh, faulty in his test methodology or any, any other disrespectful type of connotation. So that's why that sentence is in there. But we could not uh, reproduce his test results. So would you be interested in changing that uh, that statement when you submit your uh, your testimony? I could certainly remove that sentence, sir, but I'm not going to uh, negate my statement that we could not uh, replicate those results. Regarding measurements taken by my witness, Eric Anderson, at page 9, lines six to eight of APS 10, you stated that, quote, APS conducted its own measurement but was unable to duplicate the magnitude of Mr. Anderson's measurements. APS tests showed no measurable impact on the nominal 60 hertz waveform. Mr. Bordenkircher, when APS performed its test, were high frequencies in the two to 100 kilohertz range already present on the 60 hertz waveform? Uh, in other words, what was your power quality going in? I do not know that this information and the testing was done by one of our engineers. 
When APS performed its test, did APS use a filter to remove the 60 hertz waveform? I do not know. So you wouldn't know the distance of the smart meter from the measuring device either? No, I do not. Um, when you tested, um, how did you know when the meter was transmitting, the smart meter was transmitting? What type of equipment did you use? Uh, I don't know, sir. Okay, before I get into this next question, I want to explain some terms. Uh, AMI is automated meter infrastructure and refers to meters that have, among other things, two-way communication capability. AMR is automated meter reading and refers to meters that have only one-way communication. Now, in APS 10, you discussed the Northeast Utilities testimony that I had quoted extensively in my pre-filed rebuttal testimony, um, which doesn't have a number yet, I don't think. Um, at page 9, uh, lines 25 to 27 of uh, APS 10, you stated that, quote, one key reason for Northeast Utilities' negative AMI stance uh, in their comments is due to the fact that the entity had already implemented automatic, automated meter reading AMR technology in their service territories at significant cost. So please tell me, uh, Mr. Bordenkircher, is the following Northeast Utilities statement a negative AMI stance or an unequivocal statement about any and all metering systems? And here's the quote from Northeast. Metering systems are not the only option for optimizing demand or reducing system and customer costs. And metering systems are not necessary to integrate distributed resources or to improve workforce and asset management, end quote. Sorry, could you please repeat the question before the quote? So we know what AMI and AMR is, right? I'm going to go through that. Uh, so you had discussed uh, Northeast testimony, right? Correct. Yeah. Uh, and your overall explanation for their testimony occurred to me that, uh, well, I mean, here's what you said. One key reason for Northeast Utilities' negative AMI stance in their comments is due to the fact that the entity had already implemented AMR technology in their service territories at significant cost. So I think your implication is that they're kind of biased because they've already chosen AMR, so they they don't want to uh, spend more money and go to AMI. Is that a fair assumption? Yeah, my reading of, of that document, of that, I don't know that it was called testimony, but, but of that Northeast Utilities document was that um, their corporation commissioner, their commission was asking or stating that they should go to AMI and they were making the statement that they had already done an AMR implementation and that in their belief uh, they did not need the additional capabilities provided by AMI to meet their needs from a modernized grid or grid enhancement perspective and therefore those costs were unwarranted for them. That, that's right, yeah. Um, so my question is, uh, Northeast Utilities made some statements about metering systems. They didn't specify AMI or AMR or anything. They made some un an unequivocal statement. And here's, the, here's the statement they made. And I want you to tell me if you think this is a negative AMI, reflects a negative AMI stance on their part, or if it's just an unequivocal statement uh, about any and all metering systems. And the quote is this, metering systems are not the only option for optimizing demand or reducing system and customer costs. And metering systems are not necessary to integrate distributed resources or to improve workforce and asset management. Uh, so I see that as just their statement that they believe in, in the context of their environment and their version or vision of smart grid and grid modernization that they do not require the capabilities of 
in, in response to what prompted this, your statement of AMI did not require the functionalities of AMI. I don't understand what you just said about my statement. <laughs> Mr. Woodward, um, you said that this is attached to an exhibit to your testimony, correct? Yes, it is. I think it would facilitate things if you find a copy of that and tell us where in your exhibit it is so that he can look at it before yeah, he unfortunately, answers I don't, your question. I, I, don't, I don't know which exhibit uh, number it is right now. I don't think you're going to get an exhibit. optimal response without doing that, but if that's okay with you, that's fine. Yeah, it's Exhibit B, uh, but I don't expect you to read. I mean, it's a really long document. We'd be here probably, you know, till the end of the day for if he was to read the whole document. I just, uh, but um, Ms. Ho says it's Exhibit B. I'll take her word for it. It sounds about right in the order of things, but I don't think that'll change okay. the witness's response, but thanks. Um, Okay, at pages uh, seven and eight, lines 10 to two of APS 10, you explain why APS is proposing that solar customers cannot refuse a smart meter despite those customers uh, being able to do that for years. Uh, according to APS response to Woodward at 210B, which was uh, introduced as uh, Woodward Exhibit 2-5, APS has to manually read the meters of some 3,684 customers because smart meters do not work at those customers' premises since the meters are unable to communicate uh, due to being in remote geographical locations or due to building configuration type of building materials or other topographical or mechanical limitations. So if APS's proposal to not allow solar customers to refuse a smart meter is approved, what will happen if any of those 3,684 customers who cannot have a smart meter, what will happen if they want solar? So in the case of those customers, we will, because of the limitation of the technology alone, uh, we will need to make an exception and allow them to have solar, obviously, without having a transmitting meter. Our preference, obviously, would be to look at other technologies that we can use to get coverage over those areas and in fact our new LNG rollout may provide opportunities there that we have yet to uh, validate um, but certainly we would not stop a customer from from making that choice. At APS 10 you discuss the EPRI white paper titled Accuracy of Digital Electricity Meters that I had referenced uh, in my pre-filed rebuttal testimony. I had referenced it because it explained why solid state meters are inaccurate compared to analog meters. At page 10, lines 19 to 22 of APS 10, you stated, quote, it is important to note that this paper was written in May of 2010, a full seven years ago. Since that time, grid technology has evolved dramatically. AMI is now a mainstream metering system no longer subject to the, quote, startup in quote, technology type issues that are the thrust of the EPRI white paper. Mr. Bordenkircher, can you explain why you neglected to mention or discuss the other solid state meter accuracy study I referenced and that was published just last fall in the scientific journal IEEE Electromagnetic Compatibility Magazine? That study showed nothing had changed regarding what you characterized as startup type technology uh, issues. In other words, smart meters are still inaccurate a full seven years since the EPRI white paper. So in considering um, which of the exhibits uh, that you filed to respond to, we chose the ones that we believed were the most pertinent to the issue. And in fact, I would uh, again state that from APS's own personal experience and the experience of their manufacturers and vendors, they test all meters that they send. We test a sample of all the meters we are sent, and we can therefore uh, justifiably say that they are accurate. It goes towards further uh, dispelling what we believe, again, um, was an intention in 2010 uh, to 
uh, make points and, and dispel, I'll quote from myself, dispelling early negative perceptions of automated meters. Um, it's also, again, why we used the following sentence that you read. Um, AMI is now a mainstream metering system, no longer subject to the startup technology type issues. Um, again, our personal experience with the accuracy of these devices uh, to us uh, justifies those statements. So you basically had two reports to choose from, and you cho you, you, you didn't choose the more recent one, uh, I'm guessing, because it showed that uh, seven out of the nine meter brands tested shows, showed results as much as 582% uh, inaccurate. So there was a relatively large quantity of exhibits filed by yourself. Um, again, we chose those we thought more appropriate. Um, I will answer right now and tell you that had we chosen that one, uh, my response I would have maintained exactly similar to how I just answered, which is based on our experience with the meters we use and the vendors we use and the test processes we go through, our meters are accurate. So I, I, again, I, I don't recall the exact, um, in fact, I don't recall at all the content of the study you're referencing, but uh, taking what you said to just be a, a matter of fact that it's a newer study, um, it found some issues. I would still have said that um, notwithstanding those issues, we believe our meters to be accurate. And, and again, I've stated the steps we go through to ensure that. I have no more questions. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Thank you. Mr. Pazewski, do you have questions for Mr. borden -Kircher? Mr. Haynes? Yes, thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. borden -Kircher. How are you today? I'm good. Good morning. Uh, just a few questions. and. To begin with, one, uh, I wanted to address, there was the criticism, or, or I guess I'll, I'll take it this way, there, there was the, the there, there are the benefits that APS is pointing to with regard to the implementation of the AMI program that exceed uh, the, the capabilities of the uh, existing analog meters, and I take it APS still stands by those benefits. Absolutely, we do. Okay. Um, with regard to those, um, you would agree that as a general principle, in order to realize those benefits, the meters do have to work, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And 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 you, I hope you understand that staff would be concerned with the the notion that that there are large numbers of meters having to be replaced in any given year uh, with the rollout of a new technology. And I take it you you can understand why staff might be concerned about that. I can absolutely understand why staff would be concerned about that. And, and again, with respects to especially what has caused uh, that large number being that manufacturing defect, it's in fact why APS made certain to ensure that the vendor bore uh, the responsibility or the cost of those trade outs specifically to protect our customers from that. And we appreciate that. Uh, with regard to the replacement effort uh, for that particular issue, the defect that was identified, is, is that effort completed at this point, or is it still a rolling uh, replacement for those defective uh, batches? It, it's still a rolling replacement. We made the decision to not simply just replace everything in that manufacturing batch, but but on failure, then, then act on that. Um, do you have a sense of when we can anticipate at least that batch will be completely uh, swapped out with non-defective meters? Unfortunately, I, I don't. And to follow up on the one question there was that was posed with regard to your testimony in APS 10, you asked about the, or there was a question posed with regard to the analog meters no longer being manufactured. And I took from your testimony, you said that APS is actually has the capability of refurbishing analog meters on its own, or you shop that out to certain entities that APS works with? I believe we do that on our own, um, but I, I may be incorrect on that point. With regard to the refurbishment, would you agree that there's a, a finite number of times you can refurbish a, a piece of equipment before it's just not going to work anymore and you, you need a factory new replacement? I would absolutely agree with that. Uh, and, and I noted uh, that you indicated there are uh, concerns with regard to meeting quality for uh, reliability concerns and customer safety with the use of refurbished meters. Uh, Certainly from the standpoint of how many times they've been refurbished, but even more so and, and where my testimony was, was targeted in that area was specifically around the potential purchase of additional meters on the secondary market wherein we don't have any history or, or idea of where they were manufactured, how they were manufactured, how many hands they've come through, et cetera. Do, do you have a sense of 
what the customer safety issue is with a refurbished meter? No, I don't. Other than, again, we would want to make sure that it would be backed by a credible manufacturer with credible quality standards, et cetera, and we would not know that in the case of, of meters purchased in that manner. Do you expect that as the pool of analog meters that the company has to work with gradually diminishes over time? I, I assume that's a reasonable assumption if nobody's making new ones anymore. That is correct. Uh, as the pool diminishes, do you expect the incremental cost to maintain those that are still in service through ongoing refurbishment to increase progressively as time passes? Um, I do not know if that would be the case or not, sir. And with regard to the anticipated life of the smart meters that are being used right now, if the company does experience a lower um, working life of the smart meters on an ongoing basis, you would agree that in a future rate case, the commission can revisit the depreciable life on those uh, and, and revisit the depreciation rate on those uh, specific pieces of uh, components, rather. Absolutely. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you. Do you have any redirect? No Ms. redirect. Thank you for your testimony, and thanks for coming back today to finish it up. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I skip some people yesterday? I am very sorry. So, Mr. Moyes, Mr. Sabo, can I see a show of hands of other parties who wish to cross-examine Mr. Borden Kircher? Okay. Whichever one of you wants to come to the podium first, and, and then we'll get the other one, and I apologize again. Especially to you. You thought you were finished, Mr. Borden Kircher. <laughs> no worries, Your Honor. <laughs> and, and, Your Honor, you did offer me an uh, opportunity uh, yesterday. And uh, subsequent to that, however, there was some testimony that I did, would like to uh, have a bit of recross on if, if you would permit it. Is there any objection from APS? No, that's fine. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, do you have a, a, a copy of the... Uh, uh, so I have an agreement up there with you. Do I? <laughs> I do not know. One moment. It should be marked APS 29 if it's up there. I do now, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, and do you recall yesterday that uh, Mr. Gayer asked you a, uh, a number of questions about some calculations that he had prepared regarding the cost of the AZ Sun 2 program? I, I do. All right. And I, if, if I was following his calculations, they were based on a cost to customers of between 10 and $15 million a year. Was that your understanding? That, that's, yes. All right. Uh, could you go to the settlement agreement uh, to page 25 of 32? I am there. And uh, in particular to paragraph 28.2D, as in David. I am there. And, uh, and this is in the section regarding the AZ Sun 2 program, is that right? Yes, it is. And uh, subparagraph 28.2D, the first sentence reads, APS will propose a program not less than $10 million per year, and not more than $15 million per year in direct capital costs for the program. Do you see that? I do. All right. So the reference to capital costs would be to APS's capital investment. Do you agree with that? I agree with that. All right. So if that's true, then the 10 to $15 million would be the amount of APS's investment and not the cost to the customers, correct? So I'm, I'm not the rate person or how the rate base is, is produced, but I, I can accept that would be a true statement. Very good. Thank you. That was all, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Sabo. Mr. Moyes. <laughs> good morning, Mr. Borden Kircher. I have just two quick questions for you. Does APS have the capability to perform a service disconnect remotely by sending a signal to an AMI meter? Yes, we do. Okay. And yesterday, I believe it was in response to questions from Mr. Gayer, 
Uh, I understood you to state that in rural areas where an AMI meter due to its location may not be able to send a strong enough signal to communicate all the way back with APS's controllers that in fact a series of AMI meters could link up and communicate with each other to then pass the signal on. Was that your testimony? Is that correct? So we didn't specifically address how you get um, further range on the AMI system, which I think is what, what you're stating there. Um, I think what we spoke about yesterday is there are areas of APS as service territory that are so remote and may not have any kind of coverage such as cellular and or a chain of meters to get down there that there are those customers that don't have an AMI meter because of those technical limitations. That's what okay. we were discussing. Are there, in fact, areas then where a chain of AMI meters could communicate with each other to pass on a signal to eventually get to where it needs to be? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That was all the questions I had, Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Geyer. Yes. <clears throat> what? Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Based what? on the uh, uh, recross by Mr. Sabo, I have uh, one question. This investment money, does that... Does that money come uh, from customers? Uh, which investment money, Mr. Gare? Any investment money, any investment that uh, uh, APS may make, uh, doesn't that money necessarily come from APS customers? So again, I'm not the finance person for APS. Um, capital investments are, are made by APS as shareholders, and then its recovery is adjudicated by the Arizona Corporation Commission. You mean shareholders actually donate money beyond their purchase of APS stock? Again, I'm not completely familiar with how the whole finance world works, um, but I know that until the Arizona Corporation Commission grants APS recovery through its ratepayers um, of those funds, those funds are borne by others. What? sources other than customers provide APS with money? I don't know, sir. Do you think that there, that there's some, maybe some entities that simply donate money to APS? Sir, again, I'm not in the finance part of APS. Your Honor, if Mr. Gear is going to continue down this line, I, I'm going to have to object. Mr. Bornkircher has already repeatedly said that he is not a, the accounting or rate does rate um, person for for this, and I think he's now going down a line of asking for. Well, what, one final thing: Are you responding to the objection, or are you asking another question? I'm, I'm asking another question uh, about Mr. Bornkircher's recent recent testimony in the last few minutes. I believe you said, I may be wrong, that this investment in AZ Sun 2 is not. The objection not is sustained. There, you, you, if you have questions about how investments hmm. are oh. passed through to ratepayers, maybe uh, Mr. Snook is the proper <coughs> witness to ask that question of. Mr. Bordenkircher has said that he can't answer the question. Well, he already did, and that's. Uh, well, then why? <laughs> you don't need to ask it what? again. <laughs> Hmm. Well, I guess I have to take serious objection to the court's ruling. Uh, the objection is duly noted. Uh, okay. You have anything further, Ms. Ho? I still do not. <laughs> okay. You are excused as a witness, Mr. Bordenkircher. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Woodward, I think it would be a good idea to go ahead and get started with your witness. Whether we finish before lunch or not, we'll go ahead and um, get everything set up and get his exhibits marked. And before you do that, I um, note that you didn't move for admission of exhibits Woodward 3-4 and Woodward 3-5. So moved. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Is there any objection to Woodward 3-4? Is there any, uh, Woodward 3-4 is admitted. Is there any objection to Woodward 3-5? Hearing no objection, Woodward 3-5 is admitted. And now, would, would you like to call your witness? Yes, I would. Uh, Eric Anderson?
Yes. Mr. Anderson, would you state your full name and address and occupation, please? Uh, Eric Selmer Anderson. Uh, work address is 3725 East Rozier Road, Suite 20, Phoenix, Arizona, 85042. I am a forensic electrical engineer uh, working on root cause analysis for the most part of uh, electrical failures involving uh, lost property, loss of life, personal injury. I uh, am also a uh, design engineer. I uh, run a small manufacturing company. We manufacture current transformers and we also have uh, fire investigators on our staff of uh, employees. So I don't know if I got everything in there, but you might have to yeah, um, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, professional educational background, please? Yes, I am a, uh, I have a Bachelor of Science degree in electrical, electrical and Electronic Engineering from North Dakota State University in Fargo, North Dakota. Um, I have taken uh, numerous uh, courses in uh, various subjects. Uh, mathematics, um, other sciences. I am a uh, master, class A, class A master electrician in the state of Minnesota. I have that license. I'm a, I have a private investigator's license here in Arizona and also one in Illinois. I have, uh, I'm a professional engineer, I believe in uh, 10 states. I'm licensed in uh, Minnesota, Illinois, Arizona, Wisconsin, Indiana, Iowa, New Mexico, Texas, Louisiana, California, Kentucky, Michigan, and Nevada. Um, I have uh, been doing this since I graduated from college in 1987. Uh, I have been designing transformers since 1992, I believe. Um, I, I have looked at thousands of failures. Uh, I have uh, been an expert witness in uh, various cases involving, uh, again, loss of property or personal injury type of thing to try and determine what may or may not have caused uh, that loss of property. Um, I believe I've testified over a hundred times in either trials or depositions. I think that might cover it. I th thank you, Mr. Anderson. I, I'm also a member of ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Uh, and I am active in that society, and I sit on committees that write standards, ASHRAE standards, for a method of test, and uh, we meet every six months or so and uh, write standards. Thank you. Uh, you have a copy of your pre-file testimony uh, in this case in front of you? Yes, sir, I do. And are there any changes you'd like to make to that? No. You stand by it? Yes, sir, I do. Thank you. Um, sorry, Judge, to ask for free legal advice, but um, do I move that it be accepted into the record now or later? Um, first, it has to be marked. Okay, it is marked. It's, it's Woodward 4. Okay. And... Um, then it has to be identified. I think that you've done a pretty good job identifying it. You ask, and then um, you can offer it for admission if you'd like now or later. It's up to you. Okay, I, I move that we uh, that it you know be accepted in the record. Is there any objection to what's been marked as Woodward Four? Hearing no objection, Woodward Four is admitted. Thank you, uh, Mr. Anderson. Uh, would you summarize your? Testimony, please. Uh, yes, uh, the summary of my testimony is given uh, on that exhibit that I witnessed and analyzed 
the effects of the use of a smart meter on the incoming electrical power voltage waveform, that the uh, smart meter when transmitting data causes a significant amount of noise on the incoming electrical power. Uh, power is delivered at 60 hertz. The smart meter causes higher frequency to be, higher frequencies to be imposed on the 60 hertz sinusoidal wave. When the smart meter transmits information, there's a significant increase of the noise observed on the 60 hertz sinusoidal waveform. There were significant increases in the noise in the range of 2 to 50 kilohertz or 2,000 to 50,000 cycles per second. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, there's some jargon in what you just said, so for everyone to understand, I'd like you to explain uh, each line, if you, if you would, please. Uh, you said, I have witnessed and analyzed the effects of the use of a smart meter on the incoming electrical power voltage waveform. So when you say incoming electrical power voltage waveform, what do you mean? Uh, basically, that, uh, as I'm sure most of you are aware, the uh, power that's delivered to residential commercial properties uh, in the United States is uh, 60 hertz. That's the frequency that the uh, power is delivered at, and that that 60 hertz is named after Mr. Hertz. But uh, that means it uh, oscillates at 60 times per second, or 16.66 every 16.66 milliseconds. It changes or goes through a period. Uh, it's a sinusoidal waveform, uh, which means that uh, it has a distinct shape to it, uh, that it alternates, that it goes from positive to negative, that the current flows in one direction and then flows in the opposite direction, and that it does that. Uh, it changes once every, every cycle. Um, so, uh, what we're talking about here and what I tested is a uh, voltage that's at a level of 120 to 240 volts, a single phase system. Uh, it, it is, uh, had a three wire connection to it. It's so, three wire. Three wire, yes ma'am. Thanks. Uh, you said uh, the smart meter when transmitting data causes a significant amount of noise on the incoming electrical power. What do you mean by noise on the incoming electrical power? Uh, what I saw when we took a look at the waveforms that came in uh, on the power, you could see the 60 hertz, the 60 hertz sine wave, and uh, it's very distinct, and you can see that, and that there, there were some uh, levels of noise on that waveform that made it not smooth. Uh, the signal was not clean necessarily. Uh, that there were other uh, waveforms, other anomalies on that. But when the smart meter was uh, connected to the circuit and uh, it was obvious that it was uh, that it was transmitting or receiving or that the electronics were functioning in the smart meter, that level of noise or the, uh, the amount of uh, uh, the waveforms that were noticed that were riding on the 60 hertz signal was significantly increased. It was about doubled in magnitude. Thanks. Uh, so then you said power is de delivered at 60 hertz. We covered that. Uh, and then you said um, the smart meter causes much higher frequencies to be imposed on the 60 hertz sinusoidal wave. Uh, and I think you explained some of that, but what again is sinusoidal and what does higher frequencies mean? Well, the, uh, the uh, power being delivered from the power company is a 60 hertz frequency or 60 cycles per second and that is a frequency and that's a fairly low frequency at 60 hertz uh, that waveform is sinusoidal which means that it is a curve that uh, goes up and down uh, and uh, you can certainly see what that looks like in my direct testimony and in some of the exhibits that are attached to it as to what a 60 hertz signal looks like, particularly in Exhibit A. 
If you look on page 8 of Exhibit A, you can see that the, uh, the red line that is uh, moving up and down, that is a sinusoidal waveform of the 60 hertz signal. And uh, what you see in Exhibit A in the blue part is uh, the noise that is riding on that 60 hertz that has been uh, with the 60 hertz filtered out. And, of course, the magnitudes are changed a little bit so that you can observe what is going on with the noise that's riding on that signal. So that's kind of what you see in Exhibit A. And in Exhibit B, you see a comparison. In Exhibit A, you see what it looked like before the smart meter was attached to it. And in Z Exhibit B, you can see what it looks like after the smart meter is attached to it. And there's a significant difference. In Exhibit B, you're looking at, you're somewhat comparing apples to apples in Exhibit A and B because the uh, magnitudes of the voltages are the same. And if you look at, just compare the red line in Exhibit A and B, and you can see in Exhibit A it's a much smoother line. And in Exhibit B, it has a lot of noise riding on that line. It's not a smooth line. It's a jagged line that goes up and down and up and down. And that is what I'm expressing as the noise that is being generated by the smart meter. And you can also see that in the, uh, in the blue lines in between exhibit A and B as the difference between what the line noise looked like prior to the smart meter and what it looked like when the smart meter was uh, transmitting. And then you said uh, when the smart meter transmits information, there's a significant increase of the noise observed on the 60 hertz sinusoidal waveform. I think you covered that uh, already in what you just said, but um, uh, so when the smart meter transmits, it, it there's there's a lot more noise on the line when it when it transmits. Is that that's correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. That is correct. Yes. Okay. So so what about when the smart meter's not transmitting? There's still noise that it that it produces on the on the line as well. But I, I did not observe that there was noise associated when the trans when the uh, smart meter was. Uh, Connected and not transmitting, but there is some noise on the line already. Yes, uh -huh. from other things, but it is significantly increased when the smart meter is transmitting. And and lastly, uh, you said there were significant increases in the noise range of two to fifty kilohertz, or two thousand to fifty cycles per second. Um, so, again. Uh, those were occurring all the time with the smart meter connected or just when it was transmitting or both? I, it was most observable when it was transmitting. It, it certainly peaked when it was transmitting, when it was using energy from the system to deliver uh, data. Thank you. Uh, is there an electric field that radiates six to eight feet off the Romex wiring of a house? Yes, the electric field will radiate off the Romex wiring. And so then whatever noise is present on the 60 hertz waveform, uh, such as those kilohertz frequencies you mentioned, uh, they'd be part of that electrical field that's radiating off as well? Yes, they would. Thank yes. you. Uh, so it would be safe to say that the wiring acts like a transmitting antenna. Well, certainly the wiring of the house does uh, act like an antenna, and the... Uh, this noise is on the system, and it's on all the wiring in the house, yes. Uh, the frequency of our appliances are designed to operate on, on 60 hertz. Is that correct? Yes, sir, they are. Uh, could the presence of higher frequencies uh, piggybacking on the 60 hertz wave create premature aging of or damage to appliances and air conditioners? Well, I, it's it's my belief that the uh, the degrading factor are the uh, transients that can be generated due to the smart meter that will 
potentially break down the insulation on the uh, conductors and the motors and things like that, uh, and also cause failures in electrical components that uh, may be subject to those transients. So that, that certainly is a possibility, yes. Have you ever heard of smart meters causing fires? Oh, yes, sir. Why would a smart meter catch fire? Uh, typically due to a breakdown of some of the components internal to the smart meter and uh, the energy that's available to those components uh, then can cause ignition to the combustibles internal to it and then uh, that ignition uh, then transfers uh, to other combustibles in the building. Have you ever investigated any smart meter fires? Uh, yes, sir, I have. Based on what you know about smart meter fires, if a customer did not want a smart meter because they were afraid of fire, do you think that's an irrational fear or a fear based, you know, a fact based fear? Well, I believe that'd be up to the individual, but uh, it uh, minimize their risk. This certainly would be something to consider. Yes. Okay, I want to ask you a few questions about your testing protocol. Uh, what type of instrument and equipment was used to monitor transients uh, created by the smart meter? Uh, there was a. Uh, scope meter, a fluke scope meter, 215C, that was used to capture the waveforms. Uh, there, the, the meter that was tested was a Landis and Gear Gridmaster RF. Focus AXR-SD form 2S CL200 meter. There, there was also a uh, filter a uh, ubiquitous gram filter to filter out the 60 hertz to better examine the uh, waveforms of the uh, noise on the line. And the uh, the Fluke Scope Master you mentioned, uh, that's battery operated, isn't it? Yes, sir, it was battery operated. And uh, that's to isolate it from the testing system? It or? certainly does help isolate it from the electrical grid, absolutely. Without the, you mentioned you had a filter, that was the Graham ubiquitous filter, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, would it be difficult to observe uh, transients without the Graham ubiquitous filter? It certainly makes it much easier. Will you please define harmonics? Yes. Um, a uh, waveform has a fundamental. Uh, 60 hertz waveform has a fundamental of 60 hertz. Uh, a harmonic of a wave of a fundamental are integer values of that uh, waveform. So you can have a second harmonic, which would be twice that. A third harmonic would be three times that. Uh, typically, we concern ourselves in the power industry with uh, the odd harmonics, the third, the fifth, and the seventh. So a harmonic is just a integer uh, of the fundamental, a multiplier of the fundamental. So in other words, you'd have the 60 hertz wave, but then you'd have like other waves as well, and those other waves are the harmonics. That's how you would define a harmonic. It would be a, uh, I mean, you, you could have a, a fundamental that's a uh, 1,000 hertz, and then the third harmonic would be 3,000 hertz. And the fifth harmonic would be 5,000 hertz. So that's what the harmonics are. And, and you mentioned the, the odd numbers ones are ones that you want to look at. Why would you want to look at those? They're, They're more prevalent in a sinusoidal system. But I mean, do they cause damage, or what's, what's the problem with having harmonics? Uh, harmonics can cause damage, yes. Will you please define transients? Uh, transients are typically short-lived events that uh, have uh, maybe a, a cycle or a couple of cycles involved with them. They're usually uh, peak voltages or currents that occur, so it's a very short-lived event, transient. And why should anybody care about those? Well, transients are usually what cause the most damage 
to uh, electrical components and to insulation systems because they, they there's a, a peak that uh, increases very sharply and then decreases sharply, and it's the amplitude of that peak that can cause the breakdown of the insulation and cause failures of electrical devices. I have one more question. Um, yesterday, Mr. Scott Bordenkircher, APS Director of Transmission and Distribution Technology Innovation and Integration, said under oath that he could not define harmonics or transients. Yet at page 9, lines 6 to 8 of Mr. Bordenkircher's rebuttal testimony marked as APS 10, Mr. Bordenkircher stated, quote, APS conducted its own measurement but was unable to duplicate the magnitude of Mr. Anderson's measurements. APS tests showed no measurable impact on the nominal 60 hertz waveform. Do you have any idea how someone could perform testing similar to what you performed in this case without knowing what harmonics or transients are? I don't know that I can necessarily speak to that or not, but it certainly would be helpful to understand those concepts, yes. Do you have any idea why they weren't able to duplicate what you found? I have no idea what they did or how they tested or what their test setup was like or what they were trying to capture or how they captured it or anything like that, no. Do you have any idea how someone could discuss or even have an opinion on testing similar to what you performed in this case without knowing what harmonics or transients are? I don't really know that for sure, no. I'm, I'm not aware of all of those things that Mr. Bordenkircher knows or doesn't know. Thank you. Uh, witness is available for cross-examination. Thank you, Mr. Woodward. Could I see a show of hands, not at sitting at the t council tables up here, but in the audience of council who have cross-examination questions for Mr. Anderson? Okay. And here at the council table is APS? Just one or two. Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Anderson. How are you? Very good, thank you. My name is Amanda Ho. I am counsel for APS. Why don't you just ask, what are some other sources that might cause noise on an incoming power signal? Uh, basically, uh, in our electronics world, there are uh, power supplies. And uh, I think even in this case, we're talking about a switch mode power supply. And those switch mode power supplies uh, cause transients and they have um, EMI and RFI issues with them due to the way that they function, uh, by the way that they turn on and off and the inrush of current that comes in uh, when power is demanded uh, almost instantaneously. So from that, are you saying that there are many other I guess sources that cause noise on on a waveform. There there are uh, many different types of things that can cause noise on the line. Absolutely, but a lot of them are the electronics that we're dealing with. Uh, your uh, uh, computer has a switch mode power supply, more than likely that uh, converts your AC signal to something DC to keep your batteries charged. That kind of thing. Are there other sources in a home, such as like an AC unit, that would cause? Would an AC unit cause? An AC unit is typically uh, run by a uh, compressor, which has an induction motor in it. Um, so, not necessarily your AC system. No. Are there other sources in your home that would cause, I guess, noise on on the power signal? Uh, they, there are certain things. Um, a lot of them have filters on them or they don't generate uh, a high enough inrush current, things like that. So it, it is certainly something that is well known in the industry. That's true. And it's something to be concerned about from time to time, yes. Could you name a few? Name a few what? I guess sources from that would be in your home um, that could also cause noises. Well, basically, if you've got a, a switch mode power supply in any of your electronics, those things 
can have an, have an issue with some noise also, similar to what we're talking about here with the, with the smart meter.